Welcome back to the channel. Most of you will know that when Steve Orlando came over to Marvel Comics, they acted like it was a coup or something. But after what we've seen from Marauder specifically and his self-insert character Somnus, which is basically just roofing other mutants so he can sleep with them, I would say it hasn't gone all that well. I believe it was President Abraham Lincoln that said, better to remain silent and thought a fool than to speak and remove all doubt. Unfortunately, Mr. Orlando has not heeded this advice. Recently, he talked to Adventures of Poor Taste and had an interview and he comes off, quite frankly, as a putz. That's the only way that I can describe it. Mostly he's talking about Spider-Man 2099 and Marauders here, which quite frankly have not been good. If you look at Comic Book Roundup, the scores on those are actually really terrible. As you can see, the majority of both of those series are in the yellow. It's not gone very well. How does he make himself look like a putz? Well, it's a variety of reasons. One, he doesn't appear to know the history of X-Men or Marvel Comics, which is a problem being a Marvel Comics writer. He actually takes the dialogue that he wrote for characters to justify his own opinions on the characters and where they are. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. He even lots X-Men Green and his future with that title. And there's a couple other things I'm going to hit in here. Let's talk about this interview with Adventures in War Taste. This is the first question that they asked him. What was so appealing to you about the world of 2099? And do you think it deserves more praise and attention than it received? This is what Steve Orlando says. It's a cast that is more diverse where their leader is not a white man. And in fact, when they go back and talk about the people who have led the X-Men since Charles Xavier, going off at least the indicators of their surnames, you have a variety of people from outside the white sphere that have led the team. This is something that we've talked about intersectionality and increased diversity in mutant culture for 30 years to come. John Francis Moore and Ron Lim were doing it in 1992. What are you talking about? In 1985, Chris Claremont, Uncanny X-Men, Storm was the unquestioned leader of the X-Men themselves. 1985, almost 40 years ago, you go over to the Avengers, Starting in 1997, under Roger Stern, Monica Rambeau is the leader of the Avengers. There have been numerous leaders outside the white sphere within Marvel Comics in general, and specifically in X-Men for the last 40 years or so. But this guy's like patting himself on the back, giving himself a thumbs up because he thinks he did something. And that's a major problem in modern comic books where you have all these writers and they think they're doing this groundbreaking stuff. And then you realize this stuff was all done 50 years ago and this guy thinks he, he deserves like a fucking stick of bubble gum for a job well done and we've all been talking about intersectionality and increased diversity in x-men culture for 30 years who was talking about that i don't think intersectionality really came into play until like the last eight years or something but apparently that's what steve orlando and his friends that read x-men comic books were talking about they weren't talking about the adventures they weren't talking about the heroics they weren't talking about the amazing stories that have been told they were talking about intersectionality and increased diverseness within the X-Men line. I wonder why nobody wants to read Steve Orlando's terrible Marauder story. Steve Orlando wasn't the worst writer in the history of the world over at DC Comics when they had a pretty decent editorial staff. But I knew as soon as he came over to Marvel that it was gonna be so much worse because there's no leadership. There's no adult supervision, especially within the X-Men office. And you have these dipshits that have been talking about stuff that isn't important to the comics, that doesn't sell comic books, for 30 years and they're implementing it in there. And guess what? They're killing sales. Real shocker there. They also asked him, you packed a lot into your first broader story arc, including the return of Warbird and the introduction of the Zixith Warbird Cabo. What could we look forward to from this lethal twosome? The answer is that it all depends on what happens with the line in the future. One of the things I like to do is seed story. At the same time, we all know there are a lot of variables in comics. How long can we tell these stories? In the case of Steve Orlando and Marauders, not much longer. When you look at the sales, they're absolute crap. Steve Orlando's Marauders series absolutely does not sell. On issue number five, it's already outside the top 100. That is a massive failure for an X-Men comic. That is Tinny Howard shit right there. In Marvel Comics X-Men, if Jordan White wasn't such a buffoon, would have been able to spot that these ideas and these stories weren't going to be popular and people were going to give up on the story. They've already seen it with multiple writers, but they just can't help themselves. And that's why the X-Men line is dying. That's why sales aren't there. There are a couple of series that actually do pretty well, but for the most part, it's a whole lot of disinterest because you have writers who for the last 30 years have only been thinking about intersectionality and increased diversity in mutant culture rather than having fun with these heroes. What can we do with this hero that hasn't been done? What can we do to push the edge? What can we do to make a hero maybe that never got over more relevant to these times? 
And every character, Steve Orlando or Tinny Howard or Leah Williams or Vidi Allo or any of these people get their hands on, they do irreparable harm to the future of the X-Men franchise. There are no sales. There's no future for Steve Orlando's Marauder series. And he certainly knows that. And I don't expect him to go out there and be like, yeah, my sales are really bad. But I would expect him at some point to identify what he is doing isn't resonating, it isn't working, and he needs to course correct to fix what's happening. But that's not going to happen, especially when you hear this stuff. He starts justifying his changes with characters based on the dialogue he wrote for the characters in his own story. You can't make this stuff up. This guy is a complete putz. I view the work you did with Akihiro similar to what Tini Howard did with Rachel. That's a problem. A new code name in breathing new life and purpose into a beloved character who's been through a lot. What made you turn to the Fang identity and costume? This is what Steve Orlando said. It kind of felt weird to me as someone who looked at Akihiro and saw exactly as he says in Marauders, the comic book that I wrote and put the words into his mouth, he's had a name that people used to put him down. He's had a name that his parents gave him, but he has never really had a code name other than Dark Wolverine, which is derivative. And I don't know if his name was literally Dark Wolverine, probably just Wolverine. Lesson number one, never follow the lead of Tinny Howard. In him describing that he doesn't want Dakin to be a derivative of Wolverine. He doesn't want to be Dark Wolverine. He needs his own identity. First off, he is a derivative of Wolverine, just like X-23 and the other clones and children of Wolverine. They're all the exact same character. There's only one Wolverine in Marvel Comics that matter. You know that. I know that. Steve Orlando knows that. Tinny Howard knows that. But they keep trying to get these characters over. And trying to differentiate Dakin from his father within the Marvel Comics universe, he comes up with the Fang identity. The problem here is, and I'm sure he knows this, he had to have read the story, right? I assume he did some type of research, is the Fang identity is associated with Wolverine. The costume of Fang is literally a derivative of the Wolverine costume itself. How is that separating Dakin from Wolverine by making him look more like Wolverine and giving him an honorific title associated with Wolverine from 45 years ago? And using his own dialogue that he wrote for Dakin in a Marauder's comic book that he wrote personally as a verification that his opinion on the character is right is just plain stupid. Later when talking about Dakin, he says, as a character who, since Leah Williams had been working with him before, has sort of been trying to figure out how to rectify all these been through, all these toxic emotions, having a name that is really his felt like the right moment. Leah Williams, the writer that literally called Dakin a fucky thought enforcer. That's really what you want to build off? Obviously, the character had been destroyed before that by Cena Grace and that Bobby Drake stuff. And if we're being completely honest, actually what Steve Orlando has done with Dakin is probably the worst thing of all. Creating his own self-insert character called Somnus, basically putting Dakin under using his power so we could screw him for like a thousand years straight is probably one of the grossest things that's ever happened in comic books. But that's what they're building off with Dakin. I don't care what you call this character. There's no way he's ever going to get over because he's damaged goods at this point. It started with Cena Grace. It got worse with Leah Williams. And it's certainly gotten much worse under Steve Orlando. Later, they ask him, the next Marauders arc is Here Comes Yesterday. What can X fans look forward to? This is what he responds with. Bishop will even say what I just said because he has a time traveler's perspective. That's just how it is. There could have been something that long ago as to how there are mutants before humans. Well, you know what? Again, we do sometimes have a plan, so stay tuned on that. Before Steve Orlando got to that specific part of his answer, he's kind of talking about where the story arc's going to go, and we might learn, just possibly, that mutants have been around long before humans. And then he uses Bishop's position on all these things as confirmation that he is correct. The problem, once again, is this is a story that he has written. This is the dialogue that he put in Bishop's mouth. I think anyone that's been reading Marvel comics lately knows that the current Bishop we're getting in the Krakoan age is one of the worst variations of a character I've ever seen in my life. Why do they even still call him Bishop? That characterization of Bishop is bad enough. But confirming your own position and your beliefs about the character based on dialogue that you wrote for the character just doesn't work and saying that's just how it is. The argument is not over. What you say is not final. There are actually 60 years of history for these characters in the Marvel Comics universe, and Steve Orlando is not the deciding be-all, end-all of anything. Neither is Jordan White or anybody that works at Marvel Comics. If people accept it, okay, then maybe that's how it is. But if people don't accept it, you are creating art, you are creating stories, you are creating comic books, for a customer base that likes the X-Men and likes the history of the X-Men. If you can't meet their expectations as far as story craft or where you take the story and they choose to ignore it or tell you flat out you're wrong, that's just how it is. The final question that I'm going to cover here, they said, 
Can we expect more X-Men green from you? This is what Steve Orlando said. I think it's safe to say you can. I don't know if I'm breaking news there, but there you go. X-Men green has been a blast. I'm extremely excited and honored that I was the one they picked to come on and keep it going. Because the thing is, in some ways, for people who think the main Krakoa books are maybe a little too strange, which I don't agree with, but I understand if you want a different flavor, X-Men Green is kind of a classic X-Men story. And I think that tells you everything you need to know why Steve Orlando is an absolute putz, why his stories are failing at Marvel Comics, why people are refusing to read Marauders. Steve Orlando is not a good comic book writer, and when he read X-Men Green, he thought that was a classic X-Men story. If you don't know much about X-Men Green, I actually talked about the first issue, which I thought should have gotten people fired. Definitely check out this video if you haven't seen it. You need to watch this right here to see just how far Marvel Comics have fallen. X-Men Green is gross, it's disturbing, and it shouldn't exist. If you don't see it here, there's also a link in the video description.